Okay. Oh, yeah. Hey guys, um, yeah, two first names as a last name, so first name, last name, bit weird, but yeah, happens all the time. So yeah, good afternoon everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, when diplomats send beacon, which is basically a res uh, re retrospective view of APT29 phishing campaigns. Uh, since I have about 150 slides, I'm just going to skip the bio slide. It was a joke. Not 130, <laughs> but yeah, okay. not too many. So yeah, I, I'm one of the many um, IR consultants for mainland in the UK and Ireland team. And I work in IR for the last, let's say, seven years. In the last few years, we're mostly um, um, concerned with Russian and um, Chinese APTs. So for today, we're going to provide a really quick overview of APT29 and any updates uh, in the last year. Um, afterwards, we're going to provide an overview about phishing campaigns in general of APT29 for last year. And then we're going to dive into the details. We're going to discuss uh, the phishing campaigns in the form of initial access, um, what happens afterwards, how they maintain access, how they move laterally, how they... Um, um, escalate privileges and so on. Then we have a short, um, let's see, work case study of a real case um, of a European um, foreign ministry. What actually happens if um, such a phishing campaign is successful? And then at the end, of, um, of course, um, outlook in the future. What's um, what's next, and how can we actually defend against them? But let's start with a quick overview of APT. 29 and let's say threat groups in general. So Mangan tracks different threat groups and we tend to um, group them in, let's say, three to four um, bigger groups. The first big group is the APT group, the advanced but, um, persistent threat groups, and then we have two more groups. But why are we grouping them in the first place? Because we try to attribute um, the attacks of specific threat actors in order to then use this information for future engagements, for example. So we track, for example, uh, threat groups by IOCs, as we've heard before, malware families, TTPs, and so on. And those artifacts make up a threat group. And depending on how much information we have of a threat group, they might be uh, categorized as an UNC group, an uncategorized group, which is basically just a threat group where we don't really have enough information to group them as an APT or FIN group. A FIN group is basically a group which is financially motivated. So the main um, yeah, goal is to gain financial, um, financial goods why an APT is mostly oriented in espionage gigs and so on. Uh, but today we're talking about APT29. APT29 um, is tracked by maintenance since 2014, and we are um, yeah, very sure that they are a Russian nation state sponsored espionage group, um, which is sponsored by the Russian Foreign um, Intelligence Service or SVR. So it's not really news news. So but in 2022, there were two major updates to this group because um, just because we're tracking ungroup doesn't mean that this is ungroup stays the same ungroup forever. Because depending on information, an ungroup might be merged into a different ungroup. So two ungroups getting merged into one ungroup, or maybe an ungroup might be merged into a thing group or into an APT group. And usually, it takes several months or years for an UNC group to be fully promoted to into an APT. So it's way more likely that an UNC group gets merged into an existing APT. And exactly this happened in 2022 for APT29 twice. We had two groups. We first had the UNC 2652, which is mostly targeting um, diplomatic entities or close um, national uh, yeah, organizations which are closely tied to um, um, embassies and so on, uh, with phishing emails containing hard mail attachments and so on and so on. Um, and this group was merged in February 2022 into a different UNC group, UNC 2452. And this particular group is, for example, known for the solar wind supply chain compromise in December 2022 which then later on in April got merged into APT29. So we can see APT29 is not really just a very small specific group. It's a very sophisticated broad group which has different types um, of attacks or um, let's say skills as well. And if you now take a look um, at the victims and the location for the victims for APT29, we see that the victims are mostly spread let's say, in the Western world, which is mostly um, Europe or North America. And if we take a look at the target industries, they're spread across um, consulting, education, financial, government, healthcare, and so on, with a big, big, big um, focus on governments. And since APT29 is rather sophisticated, there have multiple different ways of um, intruding the victims. For example, 
uh, in the beginning of 2014, 20, 2015, they used mostly stolen credentials, phishing emails, and so on. And then later on in 2018, they be began to password spray, or 2022, where, for example, supply chain compromise with solar winds and so on. And if we now map those initial uh, infection vectors onto our previously explained um, ungroups, we suddenly can match, for example, the ANC2452 with the supply chain attack and the ANC2652 with email phishing into those initial fact, uh, infection vectors, which basically uh, uh, means that ABT29 has very likely multiple different teams for different tasks. So for example, ANC2652 main task is to gain initial access by a phishing email, while, for example, ANC2452 might be more complex, sophisticated, with supply chain compromises and so on. And as soon as this access has been established, this access might be handed over to, into a different group, which main focus might be espionage or exploitation of credentials and so on and so on. Good. But now let's get back to the original topic, phishing. So a quick overview about 2022 and what type of phishing we've identified. So ABT29 is very, very active when it comes to phishing, especially when it comes to phishing uh, government entities. On this screen, we can see here just Q1 of 2022 because I couldn't fit the remaining three quarters onto the, on the screen, basically. For example, we have here um, on January 18, uh, um, an email subject with, uh, which states node verbal, which is basically a very common term um, amongst um, international and um, governments, which basically is just a term to communicate different updates. For example, node verbal, non-working days of the Embassy of the Republic of Poland, for example. It's, it is basically just an out-of-office message. But why is this is interesting? Because with those phishing campaigns, we've seen that the sender is usually a government entity or they try to spoof a government entity. That means we've seen compromised government entities spamming other government entities in order to gain access there. So therefore, you don't, you can't inject, take in SPF in because they're all valid. Email address is valid as well, um, and so on. And the main goal with those phishing campaigns is, of course, to gain initial access. And for that, they uh, use different lures. For example, they use um, existing access to um, inboxes, they use previous um, conversations, for example, previous body conversations, they use documents which they have um, extracted from inboxes or from different networks, and so on and so on. And of course, the um, going to scrape this information, this, this send information from public information, uh, such as available on, on, on internet. For example, if you look up, for example, the Embassy of Austria in, in the UK, for example, you could see the contact details of the PA to the ambassador, the, the ambassador itself, and maybe even a distribution lab, uh, list for the entire embassy. And with this information, it's really easy to target specific countries or, or specific persons, let's say. So what are the components of such a typical APT29 phishing campaign? First, of course, we have the phishing email with some form of payload. This payload is usually a root search um, HTML attachment, um, which I'm going to cover later on. Then usually afterwards, we have some, some archive in form of um, IMG, um, ISO, DMDK, RDHDK, and so on. And then with our initial downloader. Good. Then let's cover all of those in teeth and detail. Let's start with the phishing emails. So, for example, this is a all public information, by the way. There's nothing confidential. It's public information. And in this particular case, uh, we can see that uh, the return sender was a compromised uh, state agency in Europe. It was sent in February 2022, and it was... Um, targeting or it was luring um, the victim with the subject envy, not verbal, non-working this of the embassy of Porongal, which is a typo, but it's not the first time that we've seen APD29 having typos because apparently there's the QA in their campaigns, who knows? But basically, <laughs> it is really straightforward. Um, dear all, please be guided, the not verbal attached, kind regards, and I'm um, Joachim and Tony and so on. I'm, I'm the uh, assistant to the ambassador of the Republic uh, of the Embassy of, of Portugal, which is all the information. This person is really valid. The signature is also valid because they very likely extracted this uh, signature from a previous breach somewhere else. And the main payload here is basically an HTML, which I'm going to cover in two slides. Another example, just a few days later, uh, and in this case, we have a compromised victim. So compromised victim was in that case the domain moh.gov.ps, so we have a .gov address. And if you don't know what the TLD.ps uh, is, this is basically um, Palestina in this particular case, 
the Ministry of Health of Palestina was compromised and was uh, used in order to lure other governments into getting infected. In this particular case, they um, uh, said that they are the embassy of the Republic of Poland, again, with a PA to the ambassador. And in many of those cases, we actually have seen the victim and the fact that communicating with each other. For example, hey, I can't download the attachment. Can you please try it again? Can we try it again? So the FedEx actually sent them different versions of the pails with different C2s and so on until they actually got the foothold in there. Yeah. Good. So this was the initial phishing emails, let's say. So what is it, um, the payload? The payload is, as I mentioned before, something we call root. So root is basically just an HTML document with a bunch of JavaScript in there, which uh, performs an act called HTML smuggling, which is basically just the smuggling of an additional file in the HTML file. It means this HTML file is not hosted somewhere on the internet and so on. It is as an attachment. And if I double click it, the browser will defaultly open it and instantly download my next payload, which is nv.ing. We've seen different campaigns um, where Rootso was either way delivered as an attachment or it was hosted externally on a website and uh, in an email there was a link to be downloaded and so on. Um, yeah, another example would be, for example, um, this was from a phishing campaign, think in Q3 2022, where the attachment was a PDF which is perfectly from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Uh, the, the stamp is original, the signature is original. Only this small little link here is not original. And this link then later on uh, led to a hosted um, root source um, sample in the internet. The question is now why did you suddenly move from an attached root source sample to a linked root source sample. Uh, one idea might be because they now can just bypass any inbox featuring. For example, if you would say, okay, we're stopping .htm and .html attachment, roots couldn't be downloaded. But if we now suddenly go to hosted ones, we are missing, uh, we're just skipping the inbox, which is quite neat, to be honest. Uh, roots itself is, to be honest, quite boring. It's just a few lines of JavaScript, not really any HTML, um, so yeah, not too interesting. It's just basically HTML smuggling. Good, but what is actually the spicy content here? The spicy content in here is the next <coughs> one. So Roots are usually drops an archive. An archive would, would be, for example, .iso, .img, .bhmk, and so on. And the cool thing about that is that Windows supports them natively. So if I have a little disk, I can just double click it and suddenly I've mounted a new drive. It's like if you put in, and let's say, a thumb drive and so on. And the cool thing about using um, ISO images or ISO archives and so on is that I can um, put in as many files as I want. I can even have a folder structure and so on, and I can hide folders. So in this particular screenshot, you should only be able to see the document called COVID because the folder bin, which contains exe files, CLA files, and so on and so on, is hidden, so you can't see it. Unless you have, of course, in an explorer option, um, few hidden files and folders and extensions enabled. Another cool thing is that I don't have any ADS links. So no mark of the web or no Sony Detective files. That means usually if you download the file from the internet and you double click, it's a small little pop up Hey, this file was downloaded from the internet. Do you really want to um, execute it? Yes or no? It's not the case with archives, but apparently this has already been changed with the latest November update or is going to change because Windows or Microsoft Suddenly got wind of it that not, not only APT29 uh, is abusing this feature, also um, other yes, um, spamming campaigns are using the same um, features. So what is hidden in this bin uh, folder? Usually there's some hidden payloads, which are, for example, um, Beatrop or Soul Shaker, which I'm going to cover on some later slides. But let's talk about this COVID file. We can already see here type shortcut. Um, and before that, yeah. Cool. Um, if we get back to the archives, um, if we inspect the archives, we have some, um, let's say, cool opportunities for threat hunting because those archives contain additional information which can we, which we then can use, for example, to threat hunt uh, on our, um, let's say, inboxes and our disks and so on. For example, we see here uh, the field application ID, which contains the application ID or string of the application which was used to create this archive. And the cool thing about this information is that this information is static amongst all campaigns. So if I know that ANC2652 or APG29 is using this particular version of ImageBurn version 2.5.0.0 in an ultimate version and so on, 
I can just scan my entire environment for ISO image files with this particular ID, and the chance that those might be related to APG29 phishing campaigns is relatively high. So cool uh, threat hunting uh, yeah, opportunities. Furthermore, I might get an idea of when this archive was actually created. So was this archive just created the day before the email was sent out, or is it some old stuff, for example? But now let's cover um, our shortcut files. So we've seen them abusing shortcuts. So what is a shortcut? For example, if uh, if you right-click on an uh, any file on your system and then uh, select Send to Desktop, then a shortcut is created on the desktop. And the cool thing about shortcut files is they can basically execute anything with it. So you can, I can define in the shortcut, please execute PowerShell with the command line A, B, C, D, and so on. And as soon as I double-click the shortcut file, PowerShell would execute it. But it gets even nicer because I can define different um, arguments in the shortcut file. One argument is, for example, the icon location. So every, for example, if you um, have a document on your on your desktop, you have this little word symbol in here. And shortcuts have, have also icons. And depending on what application you're executing, for example, run the 32 or Word, uh, the shortcut will automatically use the icon of the application I, I execute, unless I define a different icon. So I can execute PowerShell or some binary, but the icon is PDF, text document, and so on. on and another cool thing is that the LNK file extension is hidden by default. So the victim just sees COVID or whatever with a PDF. Double clicks it, but in the background, I execute run 32 with the command line trailer DLL and the argument trailer. For example, so it's really neat to be honest. And of course, here with similar with the archives, um, some thread hunting opportunities. For example, in the proper similar case, for example, fields such as the MAC address, which is the MAC address of the system which creates this LNK file. Same with the uh, MAC manufacturer. In this case, the embed there for the system where this LNK was created was likely a virtual system. And my favorite is the machine ID, which is basically just the workstation name. And this information is also static amongst all campaigns of APG29 or, for example, also other Russian groups such as ANK530. So if I just take this, um, this information, that is the, the Mac and the desktop, these, and then hunt through my entire environment and look for shortcuts or LNK files with the string desktop and so on and so on, then it's very, very likely this LNK is malicious. Perfect. Great. Good. Now let's get to the actual spicy stuff, to the malware. So this LNK now executes something, which is cool. And one of those things which usually got executed uh, was a downloader, Britney C, which we um, named Beatrop. By the way, all this malware, which I'm going to mention from now on, um, was the first time discovered by APT29 and is um, not, let's say, open source and so on. So Beatrop is a downloader written in C um, that utilizes legitimate services as C2 channel. There's some... Um, Encryption going on for so basically as soon as Bjob executes, they uh, collect information about the victim, sends this inf information about the victim to the C2, and then depending on if there's a payload for my victim there, then the payload is going to download it. So it's a bit sophisticated, and then usually as follow-up payload we've seen, and then deploying and executing beacon. But I just mentioned before that they use uh, popular legitimate services as um, SC2 which are, for example, the initial version um, used, for example, Trello. So Trello is a kind, of, kind of a tasking platform, which is a legitimate service, and it simply abused it to host uh, payloads and to store cast information there. And then later versions of Beachup suddenly switched to Dropbox, and then further on, suddenly switched to Slack. What is the issue here? The issue here is that they are basically not using any custom C2 domains or IPs. They're using legitimate services such as Trello, Dropbox, and Slack. So depending on your environment, if you use Trello in your environment, this is just going to hide in, in your traffic. Um, same for Dropbox and Slack. For example, if you even if you identify, okay, we have some Beatrop in our, in our environment and they're using Slack, we can't just simply block Slack because Slack is our main communication channel. So it might be really tricky. Good. Um, so this basically happened in... February uh, last year, and then suddenly um, in May, we see something else being being um, executed by the LNK files. Suddenly, we don't have any any beach of anymore with something which we named Soul Shaker, which is basically very 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 similar beach drop, but it's um, written in C sharp. So there's a sharp missing here, sharp for um, uh, .net, 
Um, and suddenly we have Google Drive. So with Google Drive's new legitimate service, with again, um, with some um, uploading of customer data, downloading of encrypted payloads, executing payloads, and so on. And in addition to that, which is a difference to uh, BJOP, suddenly with persistence capabilities. So BJOP itself was just a downloader which downloads stuff, uploads stuff, executes stuff, that's it. No maintenance, uh, uh, yeah, no, no persistence. And suddenly, Solchega has some persistence in here. And in this particular case, um, which is not on the start, unfortunately, is um, that we've seen Solchega uh, versions um, disguising as um, Java update um, and so on and so on. It's quite, it's quite neat, to be honest. So we have now B-Drop, we have now Solchega. I mean, already two custom downloads, which is quite interesting. But then uh, in October 2022, something new came on the floor, which we named Fancy Dude, yeah? And by the way, if you wonder how and why we name them, it's basically a person who identified it can name the malware. And depending on how cool a person is, we have cool names or rather lame names. Uh, but usually we just, um, so they're basically like, like password generators for kids, which basically just add two words. That's how, they, that's how we create them. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back to the slide. So we identified uh, Fancy Beat in October 2022. And Fancy Beat is very, very, very similar to Beat Drop with the difference, some code differences, and some with a, another new uh, legitimate C2 channel, which is in that case um, Notion. Notion is just a note-taking um, application, which is widely used. And of course, we have again um, some persistent capabilities um, via run keys. And we, to that date, we still see uh, fancy feed being used um, by the threat actors, by APT29. And now the question is, okay, how recently have we seen them? Um, very recently, um, for example, this Monday. Um, so this is also public information. So we see here a virus total um, link to a file called uh, forward meeting request ambassador of the Czech Republic dot email. So it's an email. So basically, somebody uploaded on Tuesday, by the way, on Tuesday this week, uh, and forwarded email with that subject onto virus total. And everybody who knows virus total is. If you have the right access, you can just download the files, inspect them, and so on. So what was in this email file? In this email file, since it's in forward, this is basically the original email, and we can see here that uh, apparently the assistant to the ambassador um, is trying to invite... Uh, yeah, the business ambassador of the Czech Republic is trying to invite somebody to some random event, and here's a link to re register. And... Uh, another person, which is apparently the uh, assistance to the Greek uh, embassy in Russia, so yeah, hundreds of different countries, ask in Russian, hey, dear Veronica, good afternoon, please see uh, the letter we received. And somehow this email ended up in our total. Weird, but yeah, that's how things happen. So what is behind this link? Basically, behind this link, we... See, this is already, um, also still live. So if you want to visit it and have a look at it, feel free to. Um, so this is basically um, the ambassador schedule for February 2023, which just um, is a um, root or download. So basically, I think with two or three seconds delay, roots is going to be downloaded, um, which then um, contains the following two files. We have our DLL and a meeting info.exe. And this time we don't have any uh, HTML, ISO, LNK. We just have a zip file and a DLL and an exe file. And basically the goal is to execute the meeting uh, meeting info in order to, of course, view the schedule of the, of the ambassador. But in reality, meeting info is a digitally signed and valid uh, application, which is a crash reporting send utility, which then uh, loads via DLL search uh, order hijacking the file bug spread RC64 DLL. <coughs> the issue with that DLL is that um, it is malicious and contains in reality fancy beat, uh, which is quite interesting, yeah. And then furthermore, is, are there any more, more recent campaigns? So if we take, for example, information from that DLL, have a look at this DLL and then maybe create some Yara rules and then perform some retro hunting with virus total, we find something like this which is e even more up-to-date. For example, that file was created on Sunday the 5th and was initially uploaded by two uploaders on the 8th. One was in Poland and one was in the US. So there might be some other campaign going on and they might target Poland. Who knows? But this information is public and we can see that they are constantly 
targeting different embassies with different um, themes, different Malware families because they constantly change and so on. And yeah, quite interesting. And again, here, no HTML, ISO, LNK. And we have not identified the corresponding email to this payload yet, but it's very likely that there are some email phishing um, going on with where, where this source checker is to find payload, let's say. Good. So let's say the phishing was successful. What happens next? So how do they maintain access, ask good privileges, um, move laterally, and so on? So one um, way of persistence would be, for example, another new malware which we named uh, Boomic. Boomic um, is another downloader we can see which persists via run keys, therefore persistence, and um, contains some different um, types. So Boomic itself tries to um, mimic a Java updater. This Java update that downloads are loads via DLL search order hijacking uh, version.dll, which is hidden in edit the local Java and the version DLL, which is a which is a variant of the original version DLL, with the difference that there's another import in here. Because now we're suddenly importing JavaFX.font.dll itself, which then is finally our final um, boomic payload which basically just downloads files from a hard-coded C2 and executes in memory, which then later on uh, leads to Beacon. Good. So if we take a quick look at uh, reconnaissance uh, and let remove movement, it's quite straightforward to go. So we have our usual um, reconnaissance of the, of the machine, of the domain, of the network. We have a lot of net comments. We have a lot, a lot of NL test comments and so on. Um, they also try to hunt for passwords, which is quite neat. For example, they hunt in SysVolts for passwords and in something called roaming credentials, which is a very legacy version. For example, roaming credentials allows certificates to roam on different uh, systems for a particular user. And it's active since server 23. Nobody uses it, nobody knows about it. And it's still active uh, nowadays. And a colleague of mine wrote a really cool uh, blog post about it if you want to have a look at roaming credentials on, on, on the perspective of a red team. And of course, they use, for example, um, beacon in form of SMB beacons and HTTPS beacons to move laterally and to gain persistence in their swell. And another cool way how they uh, try to uh, gain or try to escalate the privileges are certificates. So I'm not sure if you are aware about um, Active Directory certificate services and so on. Just give you a quick overview so you can create certificates. Um, in the Windows domain, and those certificates are based on certificate templates. A template just defines what properties a template is going to have and what properties the requester needs to have. The main issue here is that there are a ton of vulnerabilities in there. And for example, there's a really good blog post which was published two years ago by SpectreOps uh, called Certificate uh, Certified or Certified Pre-owned. It's a really light read with I think 180 pages. So if you want to look, go for it. Um, and there also re um, I uh, released a tool called um, Certify, but one thing that was specter was, was a different company. Basically, um, it's a simple clicky tool which allows me to create certificates. The vulnerability here um, by which can be executed is, for example, that if I create a certificate, I can define a so-called um, sum, a subject altered name, which is usually used, uh, used with domain names and so on, but I can also use it in the Windows domains. For example, I can say I want to request a certificate from, from myself, from Matthias, with a subject altered name, um, domain admin works. I can define anything as sum, any system, any user, and so on. So basically, with this certificate, I'm instant DA, and it works. And I've seen them abusing that early 2022 in the European government. <laughs> Easy peasy. And this brings us to our quick um, yeah, case study. So what actually happens um, with, if such a campaign was successful? Um, European government, um, they were constantly targeted with those phishing campaigns basically every second day, which also led to the point that the victims were already quite, uh, yeah, educated, let's say. But if you keep on poking, you keep on poking, you keep on poking, things, should, things just happen. So, for example, if we take a look at those two timestamps, so, um, January 18, let's say 12.34, the first system got infected with the B-drop downloader. And then later on, uh, with a booming downloader, which is persistence, then with some kernel hosting activity, and then suddenly with some uh, uh, internal reconnaissance, and then the first of my double certificate signing requests uh, was created. This is basically the same vulnerability which we just have seen before with the certificate services. 
and then so basically be, be between those two points, between the initial beach of infection and between the tech export that malicious created certificates, basically how they created um, CA, uh, how they created, uh, how they gained DA, we have 105 minutes. So 105 minutes between the initial compromise of one system until they exported multiple certificates with privileged users. In that particular case, they had two or three DAs and one highly privileged user, which is not a DA. And they, ex and they, and they exfiltrated it then. And this is basically how they complete their mission. Because the mission of ARM2652, or not, APG29, is basically just gain initial access. And they did that in 105 minutes. And now it's up to the next team. Whatever the next team's uh, mission is, is it espionage? In this particular case, 100% espionage because they have the backdoors in there and now they can just come back. And the cool thing about those certificates is even if they would take the credentials of those um, um, affected users, you can still use a certificate. And we all know that certificates usually don't expire after <laughs> half a year or a year or 10 years. <laughs> so those are valid and they're valid for good. And uh, the nice thing about certificates is that it's actually not that easy to actually identify is if a certificate was used to authenticate or if, or if a normal password was used. So to then post-mortem to threat hunt if a certificate was used is quite, quite tricky nowadays. Um, but Microsoft's also aware about this whole certificate service vulnerability templates and so on. And they now are slowly starting to um, put, let's say, measurements in place, for example, additional event logging. Um, I think with the newest versions, um, they also flag certificates which were created with vulnerable templates, but they're not enforcing it yet. Because, of course, if a Microsoft would suddenly enforce that vulnerable, temp uh, vulnerable certificates are not valid anymore, everything would break instantly. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. So how to detect and defend against it? It is tricky. There's no, 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 yeah, pill like I can easily swallow. Um, I would say we can harden and detect slash hunt for it. Hardening would be, for example, I could harden on the endpoint by simply uh, disabling or just overriding the default file letters for .img file, ISO files, DMDK files, and so on. Because to be honest, most of the normal users, they don't need to mount an, an image file. So you can just either way disable it or, for example, um, assign the text that it was a default file handler. Furthermore, I can um, disable email attachment file types. For example, who needs to um, receive an .html file or an image file, an ISO file, or who, for example, needs to open an, an, an image file which is 10 megabytes, which is unlikely, for example, to be a Windows user and so on. I could, very, uh, could be very strict on email header verification, which only works if this spoof the header. If they already um, compromised the victim, um, all of the headers are going to be um, intact. And of course, the classic uh, user awareness. Uh, I constantly need to uh, yeah, educate my users that they actually know what is malicious or what, what is not malicious. On detection hunting for opportunities, uh, we publish a ton of different Yara rules for root swap, beat drop, booming, storage, like offensive beat, and so on, which we then, for example, could run against entire environments. So it could, could sweep all systems and servers, or I could, for example, sweep uh, my inboxes or my attachments and so on and so on. And of course, as I mentioned before, the attributes in the um, LNK eyes and images, I can also use that to hunt and sweep across my entire environment. Which basically brings me to my uh, last slide, so what's next? So as, we, as we've seen before, um, APT29 is not going, going away. They are currently targeting this week, twice at least, um, government entities are going to continue doing that. The victims and victims' um, tar uh, target locations is also unlikely going to change. We even have seen uh, more frequent targeting in 2022 with, with European governments and so on. Um, furthermore, it's very likely that they're going to shift away from fancy data, may, maybe uh, deploy a different um, download because they've seen that their victims also identified, hey, Notion.com might be bad or, the, or they're using... Um, specific YAR routes, for example, to um, hunt for those. And of course, since it's APT29, um, there might be some surprise factor in, in the future. Maybe they shift from um, phishing, maybe there's some, some new supply chain compromise in the future. Who knows? And this would bring me to the end in the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thanks for attending.